Uh, for those of you who uh, are here for the first time, and there are a lot of you here for the first time, my name is Barry Singer, and I'm the proprietor of the bookstore. First Readings is a series that we have uh, inaugurated here to promote new fiction. That's the whole point. Um, we're trying to uh, celebrate uh, new novels, new short story collections of distinction uh, by pairing them with guest readers in very special readings like uh, we're about to hear tonight. Um, we began the series a little more than a month ago with a reading by Elizabeth McGovern. Uh, it was an unforgettable reading by Elizabeth McGovern of a book called In Country by the short story writer uh, Bobby Ann Mason. This was her first novel. Uh, tonight, we turn our attention to Waking the Dead by Scott Spencer. Uh, we have three readers this evening who will share Waking the Dead with us. Matt Penn is, a, uh, is uh, going to be portraying a number of, of uh, ancillary male characters throughout the book, specifically uh, an older gentleman by the name of Isaac, who is something of a mentor to the uh, protagonist of Waking the Dead, whose name is Fielding Pierce. Uh, Ava Haddad will be reading uh, two roles. Uh, she will be Carolyn, uh, Fielding's sister, and she will also be Sarah Williams. Sarah Williams is the, uh, was the love, is, is in the book, the love of Fielding Pierce's life. She is also uh, the martyred heroine of Waking the Dead, and uh, in, in probably in, it, she is also the, uh, the heart of the book, the soul. Um, our special guest this evening is Judd Nelson, and Judd will be playing Fielding Pierce, not surprisingly. Uh, Waking the Dead is uh, Scott Spencer's fourth novel. His first book was called uh, Last Night at the Brain Thieves Ball, and it was a terrific book. For those of you who may not have read it, you should. Uh, it's your first opportunity. His second book was a book called Preservation Hall, his second novel, and his third novel was the critically acclaimed and best-selling Endless Love, which was also made into a movie. And uh, all I can say to you is read the book. It's <laughs> it's a marvelous novel. And uh, after you've read Waking the Dead, which I'm sure you're all going to want to do after we finish tonight, you should get to Endless Love. It's superb. And uh, that's about it. Except for wa Waking the Dead now, I think, should be introduced by the man who knows it best, and I'm delighted that we have him here this evening, Mr. Scott Spencer. You know, when I heard that they were going to make Endless Love into a movie, th this is exactly how I wanted them to do it. I said, let's just get, you know, let's just read the book. <laughs> but they didn't want to do that, and... Uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this kind of mixed media to see, you know, how one art form, the art form of uh, acting, imposes itself on the art form of uh, writing a novel. And I'm happy for this opportunity and it's just amazing to see so many people this close to a bookstore. <laughs> so let's get to it. <laughs> Sarah Williams left for Minneapolis with our life together in the worst possible repair. I knew enough about the suddenness of things to know that you ought never say goodbye to someone you love without acknowledging that you might be looking at them for the very last time. I broke this emotional law, and 26 hours later, Sarah was pronounced dead and zippered up in a black rubber bag in Minneapolis Community General Hospital. The police informed Sarah's family down in New Orleans, but the Williamses didn't have the decency or perhaps the presence of mind to find me. I finally learned about it on the CBS News that evening as I sat in our apartment in Chicago, surrounded by the things Sarah and I had accumulated over the three years of living together. 
The picture that flashed on the TV screen was of Francisco and Gisela Higgins, who had left Chile when the generals took over the government and who had been making the rounds internationally, describing the horrors of the current Chilean regime. As it happened, Sarah had been driving Francisco and Gisela to a church in St. Paul where the parish had given sanctuary to a few Chileans who'd fled to the United States illegally. They were in a white 1968 Volvo station wagon with an indestructible keep on truck and bumper sticker in the back. Six years hadn't peeled it off, nor had 600 days of winter in the northern tier, nor finally had the blast of the bomb that had been taped to the bottom of the car and radio detonated when they were just a block from Our Lady of the Miracle. But for me, the details came later. I knew something whose terribleness was beyond anything I'd ever known had happened as soon as I saw Francisco and Gisela's faces on the screen and the newsreader said, this afternoon terror struck a quiet neighborhood in Minneapolis. And then Francisco and Gisela's images were gone and the newscaster went on talking and there was film running. I saw the white Volvo covered in fireman's foam, bare trees, a light April snow star haircut and a fancy winter coat with a fur collar. But my hands were over my ears and I couldn't hear what he was saying. And then there was a picture of Sarah, the same old picture I had seen on her parents' piano in their house on St. Charles Avenue, a picture of her sitting on a wicker chair on their porch with her arms around her knees and a completely happy smile on her face, which was rarely that completely happy. The sunlight was in her hair, shining also in the whites of her eyes, the moisture of her teeth, the little gold chain around her neck. My own voice was echoing as I said no over and over, and then I hit the off switch. I left the apartment without closing the door behind me and without a coat. The late snow that had been falling in Minnesota was now falling through the coarse gray darkness over Chicago. Somehow, I seized on the idea that there was something I needed to decide, a course of action I needed to affirm. I don't honestly know what I was thinking. The truth is, most of my effort was probably spent fighting going mad. We were living on 51st and Blackstone. I was going to law school at the University of Chicago and Sarah was working on the northwest side in a place called Resurrection House. We had few friends and virtually no money, so most of the time we had to spend together we spent alone in the apartment. I was still strange to the streets I walked that night. The lights in the windows seemed sharp and unfriendly, and the families living on the ground floors whose domesticity I could spy in brightly lit wedges seemed remote, unknowable. From time to time, I became aware of how cold it was. I looked up and saw the snow drifting past the streetlights. Sometimes my heart seemed not to be beating at all, and sometimes it seemed to be beating far, far too quickly. I made my way to 53rd Street and found a bar. I had a few dollars in my pocket and I ordered a beer. I was supposed to be stopping drinking and it didn't quite occur to me that this was the time I could back off that vow. The taste of the beer was too real and its reality made the night undeniable. The bartender had a large, white, distorted face, unbelievably grotesque, like something underwater. There was one other person in the bar, a bus driver sitting in front of what looked like a scotch and soda. There were framed photographs of famous boxers on the wall, that listless automatic decoration they use in bars without any real character. I had some change in my pocket and I went to the phone booth. I was wet, shaking. I dropped the dime in and dialed our apartment and listened to the ringing. And with each ring I thought, my God, it really happened. I first met Sarah Williams when I was 24 years old in 1970. I was in the Coast Guard, stationed for the time on Governor's Island. I'd gone through Harvard like a hot knife through butter, learning what I could, making surprisingly few friends, and, on the whole, behaving like a boy building a resume rather than a life. 
Now, my master plan ticking away, it was time to fulfill my military obligations in the least bloody way possible. I couldn't imagine a man being elected to any important office who hadn't put his time in in uniform. When I was finished with the Coast Guard, there was a spot waiting for me at the University of Chicago's law school, a spot reserved by the father of one of my few college chums, Jeremy Green's father, Isaac. Isaac and I had met one Thanksgiving and then again at the Green's cabin in Wisconsin the following summer. Isaac sensed my calculating spirit, liked the way I thought ahead. My own family, while enthusiastic, had its doubts. My father worried that the spot at the University of Chicago might not wait for me, worried that in trusting Isaac, I was falling for a rich man's idle promises. It was an autumn weekend, uncommonly hot, with the sky the color of a spoiled oyster. I went into Manhattan dressed in my whites. I was a skinny thing then, and with my startled, spiky military haircut, I looked like I'd just pecked my way out of an egg. Danny had just begun his business. It was the first year of Willow Books, and I was going to meet him at his office. Our plan was to have lunch and then spend the rest of the day getting into trouble. Danny had a real appetite for ideas and schemes, but there was a methodology to business, a certain kind of orderliness that repulsed him. He was living well. He would always live well, despite the setbacks to come. Even when we were growing up, there was something high rolling in him. He loved bets, dares, and anything impractical. The money he'd made on his bestseller had already evaporated from the heat of his plans and appetites, and Willow, even in its infancy, was living in a state of ceaseless fiscal peril. Sometimes Danny was a week or two late meeting his payroll and turnover was high. I hadn't been to the office in three months, and of the eight employees, only two were familiar. Tamara and Wilson Wagner. Wagner was an enormous redhead from Providence, whom Danny called Rhode Island Red, a linguist, translator, and avant-gardist who stayed on because he didn't exactly need the money, and because he could still convince Danny to invest in beatnik poetry, each volume of which was published at a loss. Wilson's title was Executive Editor. Danny was Publisher and President. They shared an assistant. She sat in the center room with access to Wilson's open chaotic office and to Danny's, which breathed stealth and secrecy and which was usually locked. How strange to remember talking to her that day, knowing now, as I could not know then, how deeply I would love her, how heedlessly would follow where she led me, even when it cut against the grain of my life, my plans, even when it defaced the picture of myself I carried within me like a campaign poster. She looked up at me. A manuscript in a shiny orange box was on her desk. Her hair was half covered by a blue and white bandana and she wore small turquoise earrings. A red and white striped blouse opened three buttons on the top in a way that was both casual and chaste. A light on the bottom of her black phone was flashing off and on. And so we nodded to each other and I said, I'm here to see the boss. Who are you? She asked, looking me up and down unsightly, trying to see beyond the uniform. His brother, I said. Oh, yes she said with a certain lilt in her voice, an enthusiasm I took at the time for a kind of passing attraction. He's been expecting you. Go right in. You're new here, I said inanely. Yes. The light continued to flash on her telephone. Like it so far, I asked. Love it. She said, dismissing me. Later, she would say, Those questions of yours, and in that uniform, you were so grating. <clears throat> I suppose you're looking forward to seeing your family in New York, Isaac said wistfully. I don't think Isaac very fully understood why I needed my old family now that I had him and Adele. He saw them as dicey characters. My sister had married a black man, and what little Isaac knew of Danny made him jittery head to toe. He must have seen them as bad influences and seen my continuing attachment to them as a danger, as if they represented an unruly sort of life into which I might suddenly revert and fall. 
It'll be good to see them. I just wish there was more time. Yes, but there isn't. You realize that, don't you? Yes. The election will be January 22nd. It's around the corner. I know, but how can I lose? There'll be no one opposing me. There's a great deal more to do than winning. After the election, you've got to hit the ground running. We drove in silence for a few moments. A wave of terrifying, senseless hope was going through me. I just had a vision of seeing Sarah at the airport. I wanted to close my eyes and follow that thought, to worry that inflamed nerve of longing, but I didn't dare. Yet even as I tried to let it pass, it left its traces on me, like a fog can leave shreds of itself in the tops of bare trees. So you'll be at your parents for the Christmas festivities. Yeah, I said. I haven't even seen their new house. Did, did I tell you? They moved outside the city. Ah, said Isaac with a smile. The great working class heroes have opted for a life in the suburbs. You've got it all wrong, I said. The suburbs are for the working class. The city is too fancy for normal people, and it's even spilling over into Brooklyn. <laughs> My parents' apartment went co-op three years ago, and they either had to buy it or get out. Talk about changing neighborhoods. To them, it was a tragedy. So they sold their apartment to a Wall Street couple and took the money they'd made on the deal and bought a house out of town. Very enterprising. Has it changed them? How do you mean? Well, they've always been on one side of the bargain. Now capitalism's working in their favor. I was only wondering. A way of life ended for them, Isaac. Don't you understand? It was like the weight of all the new people with their new money opened up a hole, and everything my parents once knew sunk into that hole, and now it's gone forever. Well, they've made the most of it. That's the important thing, surviving. When we got to the airport, Isaac glanced at me from the corners of his eyes and said, There's something I want to bring up with you. Good, I said. Good? Well, it explains why you're going to all this trouble. I could have just as easily taken a taxi. It's no trouble, Fielding. I'm an early riser. He was as aware as I was of my tactics, and he knew I had, for a moment, deflected him. He moistened his lips and started in again. I'm a little worried about your family. Granted, I said. I'm only talking about possible repercussions on our campaign. What am I supposed to do, Isaac? Get a, another family? Uh, just something to be aware of, that's all. You have a sister with an unconventional marriage and a brother, well, you know, a brother with all the earmarks of a dangerous lifestyle. I think of them as assets, I said. We were falling into pattern with other cars arriving at the airport. Yes, well, this isn't about how you think about them. They humanize me, Isaac. I think you're quite human enough. He glanced at me to see if I was smiling. Well, I don't, I said, and I wasn't smiling. Anyhow, if the president can survive a beer-swilling brother who makes private arms deals with Libya, then I think I can survive Danny and Caroline. And Sarah Williams as well, added Isaac. We have to expect that to come up one of these days. Yes, I said, one of these days. We drove to the American Airlines terminal. Traffic was thick and rude. Even on Christmas, I thought inanely, as if the mere birth of Christ could make people stop leaning on their hooters. <laughs> Isaac was nervously clearing his throat, as if sentiment was congealing at the back of it. It was hot in the Lincoln, but he kept his lamb's wool cap on, and his white hair was damp with perspiration. I don't even know how to thank you, Isaac, I said. Well, there's nothing to thank me for. Right, and Pinocchio owed nothing to Geppetto. Folklore, said Isaac with a shrug. He turned toward me, and with a stiff, clumsy lurch of emotion, he put his arms around me and pressed the side of his face against me. God bless you, Fielding. I know you're going to do well. Just remember, the barbarians are all around us. He put his hand in his coat and pulled out an envelope. Will you take this? Adele asked me to give it to you. I looked at the pale green envelope. My initials were written on it. The snow rattled against the windshield like a beaded curtain. There was a solid ring of taxis and buses and cars around the airport. Skycaps were pushing luggage around in their pipe metal carts, cutting unstable tracks in the wet snow. There were at least a hundred travelers, and any one of them could have been Sarah. Sarah in a fur coat, Sarah in disguise, Sarah transmuted by time, I promised myself not to look in anyone's face. I was in the grip of a long and powerful hallucination. I would hide from it.
In all the time we lived with and for each other, Sarah wrote me only once. I was still Mr. Coast Guard, out on my boat heading toward Alaska, a ridiculous mission involving salvaging another Coast Guard ship that had opened itself up like a tin of kippers against the edge of a glacier. Sarah had quit the job with Danny. She had an apartment, half a house really, on Staten Island, and I stayed with her there whenever I could. Mornings, she went to work in Lower Manhattan, doing research for a group calling itself the Catholic Action Project for Judicial Reform. I took a kind of trigger-happy pride in the fact I'd made her interested in the law and chose to gloss over the fact that the group she worked for was busy proving that we lawyers rarely gave the powerless a fair shake. Hell, I had no vested interest. I was no fat cat, and I had no intention of becoming one. I still believed Sarah and I were united in a belief in the same sorts of things and separated only by matters of temperament and tactics. These are the words she wrote to me. <clears throat> Dear Fielding, it's hard to believe this letter will ever reach you. You seem so far away. I have a map in front of me and a circle marking the Bering Strait where I imagine the Portland is by now. If you were going off to fight a war, a good war, then I could be writing this by candlelight and weeping. And then I'd go to church and pray for you. But there's only one war out there and it's a bad one, the worst ever. And even though you've promised me your ship's not going anywhere near Southeast Asia, I can't help thinking at the last minute your course will be changed and there you'll be getting shot at by people who I want to win. It's what you Harvard lads call ironic, right? I love you and I love them and I don't want to take the test and choose who I love more. One of you or a thousand of them, I'd cease to live whatever I chose. Peter Blankworth came to see me at work today. No one ever comes to see me at our little hideaway on Staten Island. After all this time, he suddenly wants to give me the money for what my abortion cost three years ago. Peter's turned into one of those men who try to make themselves seem interesting by coughing a lot. <laughs> Hi, it's late now. I wrote the first part of this waiting for my Progresso clam sauce to simmer up. And now it's three in the morning and I'm awake needing you, and it's a thousand and one monkeys on my back. It's freezing in here. I feel like going next door and waking up the Omaras. I know they keep their half of the house ten degrees warmer than ours. I'm wearing your black t-shirt under my nightgown. Remember? You were looking all over for it before you left, but I had it hidden, my guilty secret. I always need something here that smells of you. That special blend of menin and sweat and the smell of starch from your Coast Guard sheets and something else, something unspeakably delicate and innocent, like a biscuit browning in the oven. You are my one true lover, lover, Fielding. It amazes and humbles me to, to think that while I was growing up in New Orleans, you were growing up in New York, that we were eating and dreaming and growing our hair and getting ready to be sexual and we were still strangers, but our fates had been cast and every step we took was only bringing us closer and closer until we fell into that bed and you were inside me and we both knew in a moment that we'd come to the end of the line. We will never be apart. I know this. I know this 100%. We may be at each other's throat or we may be separated by 5,000 miles, but we will never be apart. We are one thing now and that thing is our love, an ideal which arose from us and will outlive us, for real love is indestructible. You are my darling. Oh, Jesus, if you were here right now, the things I would do. You'd be screaming for mercy, pal. So get off the boat. Get off the boat and come home, please. Here's my dream. She said, leaning over to my side of the bed, her chin in her hand. Do you want to hear it? Naturally, I did, though my eyes would not open. You're a young senator, and I'm your wife, and we're at a big, fancy Washington party. Everyone's there, senators, the prez, the secretary of genocide, you know, the works. <laughs> You're in a tux, and I'm wearing a very expensive gown, low cut and with little spaghetti straps. And all I can think of is, I have to keep my hands down, my elbows close to my side, because I haven't shaved under my arms. <laughs> and if anyone sees, your career is ruined.
I paused and watched Caroline take another drink of her harp. When I want a drink, I get a foul, desperate taste at the back of my throat. I swallowed it back. I'm glad you came here, I said. Well, I don't want you to lose this election, Caroline said. If you don't make it, that does it for the lot of us. But if you do, then maybe you'll ignite something in Danny and me. We need a winner here, Fielding. You hate talk about winners and losers, I said. I'm trying to get in the spirit of the times. Oh, wait until you meet the people in my campaign. It'll make you wonder if totalitarianism might be a better idea. Believe me, I expect the worst. After watching Corvino doing a Tarantella on Mom's back for 15 years. It's more of the same. Badasses looking for a free ride. So how am I going to fit in? You will, that's all. You just will. You have to. I need someone I can trust. Are you in control? In all ways but one. Yes, which one? I'm losing my mind. In your case, it sounds like a good idea. I put my fork down and folded my hands on my lap. Something's wrong, I said. Caroline lowered her eyes. Disappointment? Embarrassment? Or was she just giving me room to come forward? It's about Sarah, I said. You were talking about her a lot in New York over Christmas. I'm going through something very hard now, Caroline. Missing her? No, something else. Feeling her. I fell silent. A, a feeling of catastrophic fatigue came over me as if sorrow, like the sands of Jupiter, filled me from head to foot. What do you mean, Fielding? You mean as if she was alive? I've been getting telephone calls, messages. They come in when I'm away from Sarah. And I don't know how this is I don't know how this happened, how I could have fallen prey to it, but I've been believing them. I've been believing she's alive, that she's, I don't know, come back from the other side, or that she never died, or that there's a secret about death that's never been known, and now it's coming to light. It's useless to try and explain. I was noticing the distress in Caroline's face. I lowered my voice. I feel her in the snow. Oh, God, Fielding. Said Caroline, reaching for my hand and squeezing it. Her fingers were icy. You poor thing. Her pale brown eyes filled with tears. I miss her so much, I said, my voice breaking a little like my voice breaking like a little white bowl. She was an amazing woman. I can understand how you you could think that she'd well, you know. Desire turns us into idiots, I said. Thank God. Said Caroline. And then we were silent. Coming from behind me, I heard the furious sound of Victor's cook holding forth in an unbroken stream of Cantonese, punctuating his harangue with clumps of receipts slapped onto the table. Caroline cut a piece of her lamb in half and let out a sigh as she brought it to her mouth, as if the fork was very heavy or she was just about to become a vegetarian. <laughs> I felt something cold in the pit of my stomach. I knew she was about to say something, and I wasn't sure I wanted to hear it. I once thought I saw her, Fielding. She said in a soft voice. She carefully placed her fork on the edge of her plate. I don't know what I said just then. Something like, really? Or who? Or, or maybe I said, you mean Sarah? But I already knew. And I was already watching it happen. Like you watch something slip from the edge of the table. An egg. And all you can do is stand there, gesturing silently, waiting for the fatal little crunch to jolt you back into time. Yes. Said Caroline. A couple of years ago. It was too crazy to mention, but it looked so much like her. I was on the corner of 44th and 5th Avenue, and I turned west. I saw her coming out of this Japanese restaurant. She was with an older man, a very thin a guy in his 60s. I shouldn't say she, this woman. The woman looked so much like Sarah. I, I was so unnerved, I wasn't even subtle. I, I just said, Sarah? Sarah? And she looked right at me. Her eyes just jumped on mine. You know that way that she had so passionate it was assaultive? It makes you step back a little, and, and the look on her face, she seemed so caught, as if it was a bust, you know? She put her fingers over her lips. She looked frightened, except for her eyes, which kept coming at me. I was too surprised to be frightened or even mystified. It was as if the fact of her death slipped my mind for a moment and the only surprise was seeing her on 44th Street when I thought she was someplace else. 
And then it struck me, and I did get scared. It was December 8th, I remember that. The day before, Rudy and Malik had come home from school a with a very complicated theory about something, uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Please, I said. Sorry, I was just remembering. Anyhow, I don't know what else to say. She made a helpless gesture. I called out to her again, but this time she, oh, I shouldn't say she, the woman, the woman who looked like Sarah, took the old man's arm. He was wearing a, a, a black wool overcoat, and they started walking west, full speed ahead. I was too stunned to follow right away, but then I did. It was crowded, and the wind was coming right off the river. It, it wasn't a heavy snow, snow, but it stung my face. Then she turned around. I think I'd startled her, and she wanted to know if I was still following her. And when I saw her face again, she looked different. It didn't look like Sarah, not really. So I stopped, I turned around, you know, forgot about it. You saw her, I said. You saw her. I walked home six blocks in the snow and walked up the stairs to our apartment with eggshell care because there was an inch of snow in my hair and I didn't want any of it to fall off. I looked like a gingerbread man whose head had been dipped into a bowl of stiff whipped cream and I didn't want Sarah to miss how incredibly adorable I looked. I held onto the banister and took careful little steps. A small clump of snow fell off as I fished for my keys but I stooped down, picked it up and stuck it back on. <laughs> Then I zombied into the apartment toward the light in the bedroom. And there I was, with a head full of snow, looking at Sarah, who was just out of the shower, her face red and blotchy from hot water and scrubbing, wearing a yellow terry cloth robe with her hair wrapped in a towel, leaning over the bed while she packed her big blue and tan suitcase. Where have you been? She said, looking up at me, her eyes flashing messages of anger, concern, secretiveness with Victor and Gloria. Where are you going? She picked up three neatly folded turtleneck shirts from the bed and placed them into the suitcase next to a black dress with red piping. I'm not supposed to tell anyone, but I'm going to tell you. We're going to Chile. I nodded, as if this made sense. The heat of that apartment got to my snowy crown, and as I nodded, it slipped off me and hit the floor in a mass. I unbuttoned my overcoat, and I felt something that surprised me, an acute burning sense of embarrassment. We'll be gone about two weeks. What's the deal? We're going to help get some friends out of there. How are you going to do that? I felt my nerves go taut and the arrow of my anger notched in. It's all planned. It's not difficult and it's not at all dangerous. She folded in a pair of white trousers and then placed her blue and yellow sandals along the side of the valise. She smiled at me, but she was suddenly a shadow behind dark glass. I was barely seeing at all. I thought as a child and ached as a child and wanted to scream bloody fucking murder as a child. Control yourself, I thought to myself. I could taste the drink I wanted in the back of my throat, could just about hear the lucky chatter of the ice. When's all this supposed to go down, I asked. Tonight, we're flying down to Miami and from there we're taking land chili straight to Santiago. She walked into my arms. I held her and she pressed herself against me. I knew she was doing it to be kind, to cool me out. She had as much interest in embracing me as she had in reading a magazine. I could feel her heart pounding and it wasn't passion for me that accelerated that guileless muscle. She was on a mission. She was living up to her fondest vision of herself. If I thought you'd change your mind if I asked you to, then I would ask you to, I said. Why? because I don't want you to go. Because it is dangerous. There's enough danger and horror in the world. You don't have to buy a plane ticket to go out looking for it. It's going to be all right. Who are you, are you going with? Stephen, and a nun from California called Sister Angela. What's your cover? What will the generals think you're doing down there? I can't talk about it. Even to me? I just can't. Well, that draws the line, doesn't it? You think I'm on the wrong side of this or something? Christ, Sarah. I promise, that's all. It's all very complicated. 
we're on church business. There are, there are people inside the country who know, who know what we're up to and they'll be covering for us. A few minutes later, Stephen Molesky arrived with Father Stanton. Molesky was wearing one of those Russian caps and he looked like a massive, good-natured Rasputin. He wore his beard outside his black overcoat. Stanton seemed nervous, unstable. The horror never stops, he said, more than a few times. He was muttering, and his fear pushed me toward my own. Molesky was feeling expansive, curious about the trip, looking forward to the sun. If anyone comes snooping around, Molesky said to me, putting his arm around me, making feel like the team shrimp, being coached to go up to the plate and hope for a base on balls. You'll want to dodge all of their questions. Good thing is you've got a talent for that. You know, the verbal tap dancing. Thanks for the advice, Stephen. I said it's really helpful. He smiled at me, winked. He seemed to want to indicate that he knew how I was feeling and that if there were more time, he would have been more than glad to talk it through with me. We were in our living room. Sarah's suitcase was next to the door. Her fur coat was draped over it like a big friendly animal. The phone rang. It was Danny in New York saying he was being sued by a printer in from Pennsylvania and Willow's lawyer wouldn't give any more advice until Danny paid his legal bills. I said I'd get back to him a little later and when I turned around Sarah was embracing Father Stanton and Stanton was patting her on the back. His hand looked so terribly gentle and frightened against her red sweater. We have to go, said Molesky, and now for the first time I sense the uneasiness beneath his cheerfulness. The plane doesn't leave until 7 o'clock, I said. Molesky and Stanton glanced at Sarah as if my knowing the time of their flight constituted a break in security. There'll be a lot of traffic on the Dan Ryan, said Stanton. I don't know why it made me smile. There's something so American about talking about highways and traffic jams. Stanton noticed my smile and smiled back. Not to mention the storm, said Molesky. God's come through for us and given us a lot to put our shoulders against. Yes, I said, he's such a help. <laughs> Molesky came up to me and looked into my face. It was a horrible thought, but I could not help but reflect that if moved, he could certainly crush my head in his hands. But all he did was slap a resounding hand on my shoulder. Well, bring her back safe and sound, Fielding. You have my word. Despite myself, I felt a wave of relief and gratitude go through me. I know you will, Stephen, I said, my voice suddenly thick. Will you pray for us then? Yes, I said. I will. He checked his watch, which was buried in the thick black hair of his arm. All right, he said. We're off. He made no move to leave, however. His massive chest expanded as he took in a deep, sensuous breath. You know, the people we want to help all have souls surely destined to live with God, but we're going to deprive them of that for a time. My emotions were lagging behind events, and it was just then that it struck me that a great deal more was going on than half my beds being vacated. Whatever I thought of this mission, their courage was finally undeniable, and I realized in a lurch of the heart that I was at last present at the moment I'd always craved, the moment when time is given its color and weight. The moment when history swishes its long armored tail and begins to crawl down another path. What can I do to help, I asked. Cover for me, said Sarah. If anyone asks where I am, especially my family. I know, I know, I said. Is that all? I'd like to do something. Do you have any money? Molesky asked. Not really, $20 or something. Then give us $20, we're way short. I shrugged and went back to the bedroom, where my wallet lay on top of the navy blue dresser, encircled by an arc of hot yellow lamplight. I opened it up. Two fives and eight ones. I took them all and went back into the living room. Sarah, Molesky, and Stanton had joined hands and were kneeling on the floor, their heads bowed, their eyes closed. My goodness, I said, I can't leave you kids alone for a minute. <laughs> I don't know where that wise-ass crack came from. Perhaps from a dark little knot of resentment, but as soon as I'd said it, an overwhelming sense of emotional hunger and helplessness went through me and I covered my face with my hand. Too late. 
I was already crying. Sitting next to Isaac was Henry Shemansky, and next to him was Sonny Marchi, and one seat over sat my father, right on the edge of his seat, his eyes fixed on me in a huge and undisguised stare. He felt my gaze touch his, and he slowly shook his head and gave me a smile of such sly pleasure and such wonderful complicity that I felt at once elated and destroyed. I was pleasing him in some way, but for the life of me, I didn't know how. Was I winning? Or was I somehow exposing the emptiness of the game? It seemed all my life I'd been dropping bones at my father's feet, and now here I was doing more of the same, somehow able to concoct a magic that brought back spoils even from an unsuccessful hunt. I was sinking, sinking, and he was nodding and pursing his lips as if I were knocking the world on its ass and he and I were sharing a marvelous, ineffable secret, the secret of my destiny, the secret of his destiny made manifest by me. This wasn't love. This wasn't even something as wholesome as ambition. This was fatherhood as fever dream, relationship as hallucination. Bertelli was speaking now, something about how I'd failed to address the central issue which was that my candidacy was a part of a deal. I could, I could barely hear him. My eyes went up one row and down the other, first east to west and then north to south. I had decided that if Sarah was out there, I would simply step off the stage and go to her. I continued to look deeper and deeper into the auditorium now, and the faces were smaller, less distinct, undulating behind a haze of human heat. Dr. Brewer interrupted Bertelli, saying, I think as a way of keeping some order here, and one hopes encouraging a dialogue, it would be best if we gave Mr. Pierce a chance to respond to these questions now, Mr. Bertelli. I turned quickly. Bertelli was making a little as-you-wish bow in Brewer's direction, and I was not so far gone that I didn't realize it was now up to me to say something. I cleared my throat and waited for a minute, hoping that perhaps I had been listening all along and all I needed was a beat to recall what had just been said and what my reply ought to be. But the silence brought nothing but the faint hum of itself. Mr. Pierce, said Brewer, and at this moment his voice sounded patient, infinitely kind. Tomorrow is the election. I said in a soft voice, and as I heard those words, I realized I was simply speaking with no idea what I would say. No idea whatsoever. And I'm very aware of the presumption involved in my asking you to send me to Washington to represent you. I've been campaigning for this office. We become like dogs chasing after a mechanical rabbit around a racetrack, and then what do we do with this thing once we have it in our jaws? And now with the race almost run, I can't help but ask myself, what will I make of the opportunity I'm asking you to give me? I stopped. I felt suddenly so calm, and I knew what, and I knew what this meant. I had cut loose from my senses. I was just letting it happen. Caution was like moral gravity, and now that it was gone, I was free-floating. Maybe it all comes down to vanity, I said, but I have always believed and I continue to believe that I can make a difference. I feel a part of me can genuinely hear the voices of suffering, and I can feel the lack of opportunity, the lack of caring, the lack of love that we have allowed to spoil our great national dream. And I don't think I'm alone in this. Others see it too. You see it and feel it. But I am willing to live with it and try to move it and to try and direct our world toward justice inch by inch. I'm willing to make the compromises and endure the boredom and paperwork and all the moral murkiness of politics. And I believe that I can go through it all without really losing sight of the vision of goodness that I think many of us hold in common. Politicians make an awful lot of promises. 
but I want to make one more and I don't have the right to expect anyone to believe me. We've all been lied to so many times. We've lost the ability to believe people in public life, lost the power to believe in the very idea of public life. But with that in mind, let me just finish here by promising always to believe in the democratic dream and to help others continue to believe in it too and to protect what's left of the best of ourselves from the profiteers and the warriors and the selfish and the brutal. To make this world as close to paradise as we can make it, which may not be awfully close at all in the end, but what better way have we to spend our lives than crawling toward it? I sat down. God, that was great. <laughs> uh, I'd like to invite you all into the store now uh, after we clean up just a little bit and move the chairs around. We'll be serving champagne and toasting Scott and selling his book. Wow.